Today I have with me Richard Merrick. Richard is an acoustical engineer and alternative researcher exploring numerous topics including architecture, psychedelics, and the nature of human perception. He is probably best known as the author of both Interference and The Venus Blueprint, where he explores the intersection between these various topics. Richard, thank you for being with me today. Hi John, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. So, starting off, can you just provide us with a bit more information about your background and how you settled into your role as a researcher? Well, sure. It's, a, it's a, uh, a long story, but I'll do it as quickly as possible. I'm an entrepreneur in the tech industry. That's been my career. Primarily focused on the early multimedia and game development, graphics, some search engine development, and then internet, various internet technologies. And started a couple of companies up uh, over the years. And, uh, and uh, back in 2006, I decided that I was going to sort of get out of that world and focus on something that I had an interest in very early on in my teens and early 20s, I decided to return to that to, to see if I could determine if some of those ideas back then were correct or just completely off the wall. And what those ideas were was a geometrical approach to music theory. It was a, a set of inspirations that I had back in in those early days and kind of had to put them on the shelf in order to, you know, to per make a living and pursue some other interests. But I always kept that early interest in music theory and music perception with me through the years and started working on it full time back in 2006. Once I started working on it, I began to realize that there was something really there that I had not been off base years ago and I just didn't fully understand why some of the things that I was coming up with seemed to be accurate. And uh, so I was able to, with the advent of the Internet and research portals and various things like that uh, for scientific papers, I was able to uh, begin to build a theory that I call interference theory or harmonic interference theory to describe how music perception works. And that led me into the study of uh, the history of harmonic science and it led me into merging some of those ideas with quantum physics and some of the latest uh, research papers in acoustics. And uh, off we went and I started writing some books. Your first book was titled Interference, and it did focus on this interference theory of perception. So can you elaborate a bit more on that subject and how your theory has expanded since you first published that book? Right. Well, you know, it's if I had to explain what interference theory is, it's it's really pretty simple. It, it says that that the same physics that are at work in music or the transmission of music through the air, which is waves that are essentially interfering and creating these composite, very complex waves that hit our eardrum, that the same physics at work in that is actually at work in the formation of the human body and various organs, the human brain, the auditory system, and that that in the simplest explanation, the human body and, and other life forms are a form of music. That it's a interference pattern of resonating atoms, primarily carbon and water, that are creating uh, certain patterns that uh, are universal, and that when we listen to music, or listen to sound of any kind, but music in particular, we're doing a pattern match of those interference patterns out there in the air with the interference patterns of our own physiology. And by comparing the phase shifts and the alignment of, of those, we're able to actually recognize musical patterns and sort them out in, in our auditory system and our, and our brain. And uh, are able to ultimately feel them and emotions. And so this theory that I propose is kind of a bridge. It's a theory that's common to both sound and and the body and the human life. It goes in different directions as a result. And I think that this theory is, in some form, the original theory that goes back many thousands of years and formed a foundation for ancient religion. And uh, we find a lot, we find a very heavy emphasis on music and its relationship to the body in, uh, you know, ancient Vedic literature, 
uh, the Rig Veda and Upanishads and things like that that were developed since then. And that proliferated into all the various religions that we see today in one form or another, music being a foundation, one of the foundational elements. Part of music is acoustics and geometry and symbolism and the whole set of things comes out of this. And again, it all sort of, come, in my opinion, comes out of this understanding of nature as a form of music. You know, in reading the theory and, and understanding it more and more as time has gone on, I see it as kind of a merger of you have Neoplatonism meeting this sort of newer field theoretical approach to understanding particles and matter. Now, that idea has been around a long time, but for a long time, the focus has been on particles more than waves. And so only more recently, I think, are people coming around to that idea, at least on a explicit level. So in that sense, your idea fits very well into what we're already starting to grasp about the quantum world and the subquantum world, about how these things are not really corpuscular, they're distributed waves, and they interfere with each other. And that is where we get you know, your probability distributions, all the weirdness of the quantum world has to do with interference. And so in that sense, this is very much in line with what we're discovering in quote-unquote status quo science as well. Would you agree or disagree with that? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, by all the music people that I knew, they were just really put off by my use of the word interference for the title and for the name of the theory because it sounds like it's a bad thing, you know. If something interferes with you, it's it's uh, you know it's it's keeping you from achieving something. And a lot of people think it, when it's applied to music that it somehow connotates something bad. But the truth of the matter is this: that everything, musical harmonies, disharmonies, you know, what it doesn't matter. Anything that is in the form of waves creates interference patterns. Now, the the interference patterns I and mean, the definition of an interference pattern, which is very important, is that it's a stable pattern. And so if you have a lot of chaotic waves and dynamics in a wave-laden system and there's no reflection, there's no it's, it's a very broad spectrum kind of set of waves, you won't necessarily get and probably won't get a stable interference pattern. And so when we talk about interference patterns or any kind of theory around interference, it requires stability and order. Persistence is another way to think of it. And so the most persistent wave pattern in the universe is a harmonic wave pattern that's uh, composed of a standing wave, a fundamental standing wave frequency, uh, with harmonics that, quote, piggyback or emerge or, or heterodyne, there's various words that are used in science, off of that fundamental. And it's in that patterning of harmonics that we get stability. And out of that stability comes things like star systems, planetary systems, you know, life forms emerge from that, crystals, you know, any any sort of orderly matter, it ultimately comes from some sort of containment field, reflection, resonance, standing wave and harmonic formation. And so the fact that, that that's a universal system. It's universal to energy being contained in gravity fields within a spatial structure, within a field of space, and pressure acts to create these, you know, to bring the order together and uh, within that. And then there's a set of physics behind that, and matter and ultimately life emerge from that. And so when we listen to music, we're hearing that order in our own body. It's not just out there, it's also inside. Can you just briefly better explain maybe how do we get stable patterns in space? The space-time, when you think of the ultimate open system that has no boundaries, you might think of space. So how do we have actual stable patterns? Do we conceive of space as a container? Or what are the boundary conditions for these waves to actually form and stay stable? Okay, yeah, so that's a big subject. And we'll start very simply that, that space is not an empty void. The idea that's space was some sort of etheric medium or some sort of some sort of a structured medium through which light vibrated, for instance, was an old idea. It's been around since really since the Rig Veda, but Greeks, I mean all the everyone just presumed that that is what space, the ether, was, was it was some sort of a structured field. And then in the early twentieth century, the Morley Mickelson 
experiment was taken to disprove it. However, in recent years, there's been very fine instruments that weren't available back then that are once again confirming that space is, uh, is some sort of a plenum is the, is the word that is better to use than, than let's say a vacuum. A plenum presumes a, a, some sort of a medium and it presumes pressure. So space has fields of increasing pressure and that's created by matter gathering together into clumps and, and when it does that it warps the field of space and in quantum physics so this is this is study as uh, the chromodynamic lattice which is a quantum field that is cubic generally is, is the way it's treated and really since the beginning of quantum theory it was presumed that space was cubic because meaning at the smallest level each quanta is a cube in its fundamental structure because the most stable atoms or elements have electron fields that intersect the corners of the cube and the ones that are less stable have electrons that don't and so it was presumed that this you know the stability of the simple atoms in particular were dependent upon the corners of the cube now you've got people like Nassim Hermine whose theory of the quantum field is based on the cube octahedron and that space breathes between a cube a pure cube structure and a dodecahedron and in between it, it intersects this cube octahedron and that's a likely scenario from what I've been able to study and it, it's compatible with harmonic theory is that there is this uh, resonance of space and that when you create fields of pressure which begin with gravity around the clumps of matter and are increased when you have for instance atoms of air which create air pressure and then you have atoms of water that create water even greater water pressure that the more pressuring fields and groups of, of atoms of certain elements you have the more you create at one level you create spheres and within these cubic fields and then as something let's say in the simplest term explodes or grows uh, within this field then it begins to assume structure you know a snowflake for instance is under pressure uh, water as it's crystallizing is under pressure and because of the res you know the particular resonant properties of uh, water the water of hydrogen and oxygen, you know, atoms within a water molecule, as this becomes, you know, as these become linked under pressure in a mesoscopic level and, and so forth, it crystallizes into a predictable shape. And so life does the same thing. Basically everything does. But it all begins with a structured space that's cubic at its simplest, and that pressure forces atoms to align uh, according to their resonant frequencies. So, a couple things. First, the concept of the ether, just in case people think we're spouting pseudoscience or something, there's two Nobel laureates that they should look into, Robert Laughlin and Frank Wilczek, and they speak extensively on space-time. What is space-time? What is the ether? Is it emergent? Is it primary? These are very serious questions in the scientific community, and they're not fringe ideas at all. It's merely a matter of interpretation. So there's no question that the vacuum of space is not a vacuum. Now the question is, you know, what sorts of rules hold for it and all this, and get into the technical details, but the fact is it's there. And I think it's relevant to both human development, cosmogenesis, everything you could think of. There's a fractal structured order down there that the process is just ingrained in nature. I don't know how it got there, but it's there. And that's just fascinating. So to think from, you know, the bottom up, let's start with the vacuum, and then what are the vacuum dynamics, and how do we get to where we are? So it's a, it's a very reasonable approach to trying to understand how nature's working. Exactly, and, exactly. I've, I've been wanting to uh, to get some T-shirts printed up that say, bring back the ether, you know? <laughs> I thought I could sell quite a few of them. And, but, yeah, and, and I mean, like, Wilczek and Laughlin, they, they use that word explicitly. They're not shying away from it anymore. It's just been relegated to kind of the back of the bus of, of science. You know, it's always in the equations. It's always 
it's relevant, but no one really focuses on it to the point where it's like, oh, can we engineer the vacuum? What can we do with it? How can we better understand it? So. Yeah, it's it's just it was such it was so out of style for so long that you know some generations grew up feeling like it was verboten to mention or to even even suggest it, and so so much of the history of, of 20th century science, you know, physics was coming up with ways to talk about it that didn't necessarily encourage you belief in it. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it was and, modeling. It was all about modeling, you know, not about reality, but modeling somehow. So, yeah, it's it's now becoming much more accepted. It's, I don't think they've got it properly pulled back into the educational system. That'll still take a few decades, probably. But you know, if you go to some of the government, you know, research sites and you look at the papers, I mean, they're in high energy physics. You'll find it's all based on uh, structured space. I mean. They don't mince words at all about it. You know, they present uh, rather sophisticated experiments and, that are based on it. So, based on that presumption. So it's anyway, things are changing, but but at the same time, you know, we, we still have to somehow move forward, regardless of what biases may be out there. And and for me, that means independent research and pulling together things that. That makes sense. And I'm not, you know, I'm not really trying to convince the scientific community of anything. I'm actually, my interest is in pulling together some information to make people think and to change their, or hopefully modify their biases and add some new thoughts. And that in the process, they'll convince themselves. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just one more thing about the ether. Now they just call it the Higgs field. It's a scalar yeah. Higgs field that initiated the inflation of the Big Bang. You know, it's like you said, it went out of fashion, and now they're just trying to find ways to incorporate it without saying, oh, we messed up, and now we look like idiots, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the and this last thing before we may move on to the next subject is, your model also, to me, mimics, I don't know if you're familiar with reaction diffusion systems. Have you heard of those? Well, to some extent, but in what way? Well, reaction diffusion systems, in this sense, you could think of them during biological development, where you have a mass of or a chaotic system far from equilibrium of, say, cells. One cell sends out a concentric ring of chemical signals that brings in more cells. And then you get these kind of interference patterns start to form amongst the constituents of cells that are emitting chemicals and self-organizing. So yeah. I like to bridge the gap between your theory and standard science through general systems theory. And yeah. reaction diffusion plays a heavy role in general systems theory. So I think you're taking a, the right approach, which is a general systems top down. This doesn't mean tyrannical or anything. It just means the whole can shape the parts as much as the parts can shape the whole. Yes. Yeah, and of course, all those chemicals, you know, they're they're all, while they may be fluid and, you know, seemingly chaotic, there's patterning waiting to happen within any of those dynamical systems, you know. All it takes is a more orderly environment over time and you know, the, all of the, whatever the resonant properties of the cells or the chemicals you know, all of those interact, and resonance is a, is a, as a general, as you suggest, a general unifying principle behind all of that. And, and, you know, all we have to do is look at the results, you know, look at the structure of DNA, look at the structure of life forms and, in, in its many forms, and see commonality across all of those. And a lot of people point to, oh, well, it's all because, you know, we came from some you know, ancient core DNA, but that's not actually answering any question. That's just pointing to, yet again, another downstream evidence or downstream product of something that was going on in a, a more primordial form before that. That's where science, especially evolutionary and biological science, tends to get hung up, is that they start somewhere, somewhere above, you know, uh, something. They have some principle. I mean, Evolutionary theory is primarily molecular. Therefore, they, they don't really have to discuss, you know, what the effects of atomic level resonance or crystallization has on a cell's evolution. And, and by the way, they, they don't, there's no, there typically isn't, there are obviously some well-renowned evolutionists that were cosmologists as well and tend to see evolution as 
human evolution or animal evolution as a, an extension of cosmological evolution. But Darwinian evolution to this day is very, very restricted to the molecular and, and cell level up and really doesn't see itself within a larger context of cosmological evolution. And I think that's a real problem because that keeps them from having to take into consideration some of these things we're talking about, such as, you know, the structure of space and, you know, how crystallization patterns from the subatomic and atomic level develop and, and would propagate into living crystals, liquid crystals, and so forth. So Darwinian evolution is is correct to an extent, but it's incomplete. And so some of what I've been working on has been taking me in that direction as well, that, okay, we need to enhance the theory of evolution in order to be able to answer many of the questions that are separating, say, spiritual and religious concerns from the scientific community. You know, there is a schism there, and it developed historically, but it's time that it needs to start coming together for people. And I think so there's sociological implications of all this as well. And all of these are part fall out of an appreciation and understanding for the simple physics of resonance and harmonic formation. The way I like to liken our view of evolution now is kind of our view of physics under Newton. So evolution as we understand now, yes, clearly it's at play in that it's highly relevant and we're not creationists, but at the same time, it's limited. It has domains that it simply cannot explain. And so I feel like we need a kind of a relativity of evolution to come into the picture to provide a more holistic, nuanced version of what we're seeing in biological development. Because, you know, a lot of really prominent scientists, physicists, biologists, I think the best book written on this is Brian Goodwin, called How That Leopard Changed Its Spots, where he basically argues that, you know, of course, molecular DNA, it's important. It helps map out the particulars of an organism. But he goes on to say, similar to what you're saying, that the shape, the dynamics of the system, the how the forces are playing with each other, that is what's leading to form it, these dynamics, these interference patterns. These are environmental to a degree where, again, it's like the whole shaping the parts and not this little DNA mapping out all of your human destiny and what you are as a person. So I think moving away from that and, and changing our view to a more contextual, it's not a return to Lamarckianism or anything, but at the same time, it's... <laughs> We have to open up new paths because Darwinism not only is limited scientific theory sociologically, I think it's limiting our perceptions of ourselves and what we're capable of. It, it certainly is. And it, it's also heavily influencing people away from, A, taking anything seriously from the past, you know, because, as if all those millennia of wisdom gathering is just oh so relevant, irrelevant, you know, because now we know things. And, and the truth of the matter is that uh, we've really blinded ourselves to some of the things that all these people before us have, have laid out, not necessarily in the same way that we would today, but, you know, they are pointing the way. And it's, it's a little bit arrogant, a lot arrogant, really, for modern science to believe that, you know, that everything before was entirely, you know, based on superstition and, you know, bad thinking. The truth of the matter is that, you know, every generation has had its Einstein, you know, or its Max Planck. And they just said these things and they gathered their information in a different way. They were much more based on observation than, let's say, mathematics and theory. It was very clear to them when they saw you know, the shape of a leaf, and then they saw the same shape uh, in the shape of a, of a beetle or human organ, that there was a relationship there. And that sort of thing is just not done anymore. And so there, there really is a, a revolution that has yet to come in science. And, and I'm not sure where it'll start. It might actually start in brain science, you know, in cognitive uh, science, but it's it's not there yet. It's nowhere there yet. There are a few people that are working on, for instance, theories of consciousness based on resonance, wave patterning, and that sort of thing. But they are very very fringe and not accepted. You know, their papers are not accepted for publishing and things like that in the major journals. So there's still a lot of a lot of work yet to be done. I do think it's pretty unfortunate that a lot of times we do turn our back on. Again, what are 
forerunners have brought forth, the, the knowledge that they've accumulated and the dismissive as superstition. But what we keep finding again and again is that through our quote unquote more sophisticated ways of exploring the world, we come to similar conclusions. So, you know, the idea that everything's connected, very old idea. It's been borne out by quantum physics, chaos theory. The world is not dividing particles that have their own inner landscape and no connection to the outer world. So I think that's been misleading us mightily. And I think a lot of the pushback against ideas that merge ancient knowledge with more modern conceptions is that status quo modern day science is hell bent on pushing religion out completely, denying all forms of spirituality. And I'm not necessarily a deist or anything, but at the same time, I feel that's kind of a foolish agenda and that that's kind of an old prejudicial thing rooted in the old competition between the medieval church and the emerging renaissance. So I feel yes. like it's antiquated and it's no longer serving us to keep drawing these false distinctions. And, and really, we have to lay the feet or lay the sins of particular belief systems, I guess, at the feet of the institutions and the people that propagate them and not the fundamental concepts themselves, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, a big part of the problem is that we just don't have very good terminology to bridge the gap either. I mean, religion is a word that has, I mean, it comes from you know, religioning or relinking. Uh, so the idea that it, it came out of a desire to relink or the, the word and the various uh, systems, belief systems around that was based on the idea of, of wanting to relink, you know, the human spirit or the human consciousness with uh, God. Whatever God was, that, you know, and however they defined it, they wanted to relink. And so there's still a great gap or a great hole of knowledge in conventional thinking as to what relinking is and what it meant and the science and the fact that there was actually a science behind it that became, you know, distorted and convoluted and uh, corrupted over time into basically political systems. And that's what the Roman church became, as it became a political and governing system, and it still is to this day. And governments actually came out of those religious uh, organizations and laws. Western government in particular developed out of the Roman church. And so we're still living within a an ancient you know, worldview, an ancient, you know, Roman political worldview that was founded in religious belief. And that, unfortunately, was a foil to the early natural philosophers and their, and I say the early, there's, there's many of them. I'm, I'm really thinking of, well, all of them. <laughs> While the, the Roman church was, was in control of much of Europe, but also during the Renaissance, and Galileo's story being an example of the conflict between, you know, the rational analysis and, this, and exploration of nature versus what the church said was reality. And uh, as a result, has ever since been huge pushback against the church for that. And, and yet, things like spiritual concerns which again is a word that needs to be defined as the word God needs to be defined because when we'll often talk about God and then everybody will have their own idea of what that means and yet we'll carry on conversations and have arguments about it. So defining these words and, and finding links between them is something that, you know, there's a number of researchers these days that are dedicating themselves to that. How should we define these terms and in ways that the scientific community can begin to latch onto or at least appreciate. So my my interest in harmonic science and in music theory led me to study the historical development of what would be called harmonic science, or really the, the study of harmonics in nature, in music and in nature, and that led me right back to the origin and development of religion. And what were the temple builders doing? You know, why, why did they build temples in the first place? What was the, what was the purpose of the sacred geometries that they began to use and, and the symbolisms and, 
so there's a whole collection of things that all intersect harmonic theory that lead you in the direction of the evolution and development of religion. That is what I pursued in, well, it was my third book, actually. It was my second fully published book. That's the Venus Blueprint. That was what I, I wanted to do with that area of study, was to try to understand, you know, how did religion develop and to what extent did musical theory or harmonic science influence that and provide a foundation. And I, and I found a number of things I didn't expect to find when I started down that road. It was, it was quite shocking, actually. And your journey into writing the Venus Blueprint started with Rosalind Chapel, right? Can we start there and, and maybe go into yes. it from there? Yeah, so while I was writing Interference, I was looking for ways to explain some of the concepts to people that weren't necessarily, you know, purely technical, things that they could, you know, appreciate and relate to. And one of those was Rosalind Chapel. And what happened there was uh, I saw a press release come out, and I guess it was in 2004 when the press release came out, that said that uh, a father-son pair over in Scotland had decoded music that was carved into the arches of a 15th century uh, Roman Catholic chapel uh, in Roslyn. That's the Roslyn Chapel. You know, there's a variety of mysteries surrounding that place, um, and it was actually touched on at the end of the Da Vinci Code when they went searching, you know, for answers to the book that had developed up to that point. Well, you know, everybody knew about that, and so I knew, knew what Rosalind Chapel was, but here was a, a press release that said that a real mystery kind of had had surfaced or had been there and that had been solved. And what it was was that it was Tommy and Stuart Mitchell. I still communicate with them. I have continued to occasionally do, you know, research and things or, you know, we trade information. I ended up going over there, flying over there, uh, after some preliminary analysis of uh, the chapel from a geometric point of view and, and symbolic point of view, and found a lot of things that pointed to that chapel being a chapel to Venus, you know, to the goddess of Venus, in particular the Hebrew goddess of Venus, which was named the Shira. So I, I went over there, and they took me uh, in and showed me, you know, around and, you know, explored uh, above and below ground, because it has a um, has a crypt below ground that's sealed, but they have a sacristy that's next to it. And I noticed, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful place. And anybody who wants to just be completely blown away by what was going on in the 15th century uh, in the early Renaissance should go there and look at this place, because it's a storybook in stone. But when I went down into the sacristy, I saw some etchings on the walls and these is not carvings, but just uh, like they took some sharp implements and and etched some drawings. Uh, and some of it was uh, astrological or astronomical, little stars and things like that, little pentagrams uh, indicating certain stars and places. And right across from where the opening of the crypt would be, if it weren't sealed, was a an etching of a tower that looked like a an oil derrick a, a little bit, it looked like an oil derrick or an electrical tower which seemed very sort of out of place to me, uh, very odd that there would be a tower that was carved in the 15th century that looked like something modern, or quasi-modern. And so I took picture, pictures of it, and from talking with, with the Mitchells and some other people, you know, nobody really knew what that was or what it meant. Well, when I came back, came back home after the trip, I uh, started... I don't know, studying different things. And I started with this idea that this was probably a, a chapel dedicated to the goddess of Venus, you know, and that the planet Venus had something to do with it. And there's lots of other things about the chapel that indicate that it, that Venus was a very significant part of it. I mean, Venus was the morning star and the evening star, and it rose before the sun in the morning, and uh, it was considered the resurrector of the sun. And so there's a whole cosmology behind that, you know, that Venus was actually the thing that sustained the sun and that uh, you know, resurrected it. It was a, a sort of a mother figure. 
And so I started looking back into the most ancient history around Venus, and I found a paper, some scientific papers, about Venus, its namesake being given by the Romans, uh, was taken from an older name that was in the Rig Veda, which was Vena. And she was the sky goddess associated with Venus, the planet. And then when I started searching a little bit more, then suddenly I started seeing, uh, finding these pictures or illustrations in uh, ancient uh, manuscripts of uh, something called Mount Maru that was stylized into a tower by, uh, in particular, by the Jains, uh, Jainist, uh, which is a sort of a offshoot, I guess, of Buddhism and Vedic belief. And so, so I started turning up quite a bit of uh, literature about Mount Maru and and this uh, this idea of a sacred mountain that takes you that extends from the deepest depths of the ocean up to the sky and into space, and that the gods lived at the top of this tower or this mountain or pyramid or temple or whatever word you want to associate with it, and that there was an entire cosmology then that was a fertility cosmology of the sun and the and Venus, and between them you know, having a sun, which is the moon. And so there's various deities associated with these, really through time. But if you go back, all of these astrotheological belief systems were appear to be grounded in something close to what the Rig Veda describes. Well, I just started following that pattern of logic and in the process discovering this very interesting connection symbolically, geometrically, frequency or you know harmonically uh, between the patterns that Venus makes in the sky, which is a rose-like pentacle. That's the name Rosalind, which means uh, is a reference to the rose. And and I found this geometry in the organization of the architectural design of Rosalind Chapel itself. And what was a real surprise is, beyond that, is that this particular geometry, this uh, rose-like or pentagonal geometry, when it's organized in the way that it was with uh, Rosalind Chapel, you find a double square on the inside, and you have certain acoustical properties that correspond to that. And it has to do with harmonic science again. It goes back to uh, how harmonics form and things like resonance and damping and concepts like that uh, applied to a stone ch a stone temple. And what you'll find is that this double square allows sound to propagate freely within the and and, and so that you can hear very well at the back of this uh, of such a building or such a room a double square room, but that it won't echo because the diagonal of a double square is the square root of five. If you know the formula for the golden ratio, it's based on the incommensurability of the square root of five. You cannot propagate in these waves. Uh, waves won't propagate. They'll dampen and deaden uh, in diagonal directions and resonate only in orthogonal or right angles. And so you get rid, you, you create order within this sacred space of a stone temple that's built with a double square. And looking further, you'll find many chapels, cathedrals from the Middle Ages throughout uh, England and, and, and Europe were double squares. And they were specifically multiples of 72 feet. And so there's actually a relationship between, you know, the uh, measurement of a foot and the speed at which air uh, sound propagates through air at certain temperatures. So there's this, there's more to the the old measuring systems than a lot of people realize. It was very much had to do with uh, acoustical properties and what's been called sacred geometry. And the sacred geometry fundamentally. Uh, has to do with this five-point star configuration, and within that, a double square that can be uh, formed. 
And you'll see, for instance, the King's Chamber and the Great Pyramid is, is a double square. You'll find double square is used in all, I mean, it was, it was central to Solomon's Temple, and thus you'll find double squares used in the, in the Mormon temples exclusively, and uh, also in most, at least classical, uh, organized Masonic lodges, because both Mormonism and Masonry are connected to the legends and the various mystery schools around the Temple of Jerusalem or Solomon's Temple. And so there is this, this understanding of the sacred space that is connected to this ordering geometry of Venus in the sky, and uh, it uh, amazingly produces a sacred space that has certain acoustical properties. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. Now, okay. the question is twofold. One, where do you think the science originated? How did they figure it out? And then, what were they using the temples for? And third, how do psychedelics yes. enter into the equation? Well, I think they figured it out. You know, and this is what I go into in the book, is that I'm looking for ways they figured it out. I think that they just looked up there, they, they traced the pattern, of Venus over an eight-year period, which is its resonance cycle with, with Earth, and they kept checking it, and it kept repeating. So they thought, well, you know, this is the pattern that we're seeing in the sky is that of a rose. And then they look down, and they see the same pattern in a flower and a rose, and they say, this is a sacred pattern. So let us use this as a blueprint. What? I call Venus blueprint. Let's use that as a blueprint to build our sacred spaces. And it just so happens, I say it just so happens, it's it's not a coincidence, a random coincidence, it's very much part of the story, and that is that the human body and mammals, you know, organize in a five-fold pattern as well. So they're looking at all this and they're going, okay, let's use this pentacle pattern in some way to to build our temples. And and when they did so, they began to realize that there was, that they could create stone temples that had certain resonant properties that enhanced, uh, for instance, chant or any kind of singing or musical performance within the space. That it would have certain, let's say, calming or certain, certain properties on the human brain in their meditative states you know, when they would have the right acoustics for their chanting. And chanting began in caves or cave-like structures that were often tuned by carving a cave out or, or placing objects in different places, and they could match the cave with their resonant tone. And there's some examples of that. But ultimately, they came out of the cave and began building their own stone caves, if you will, that were more geometric and more specifically engineered to modify human consciousness. Okay, so, you know, this process was kind of probably, you know, much like the other things in science, you know, they observe and then they reproduce and experiment and then they start discovering properties and, and fine-tuning that and improving it and embellishing it. And that's, that's where the temples sort of came from. They originated in the Vedic stupa structure. And so all of the domes and bell towers and things like that that you see in both religious buildings and government buildings in many town squares all are, are Vedic stupas. And they're all based on this uh, cosmology that is laid out in the Rig Veda. So even the most Christian cathedrals are really Vedic in their origin and meaning. But, of course, the, the more we got into the 20th century, uh, the more we forgot what a sacred space was. And now we have auditoriums and churches and things that are developed that have that aren't really sacred spaces in the ancient sense of the word. They're not acoustical. They don't enhance resonant chant or music in any way. And they're really just to fit as many people as they possibly can into a space <laughs> and preach. It's It's not about... Uh, actually having personal revelation. So that brings us to your last question, I think, uh, has to do with psychedelics, which seems to come out of 
left field, and that was one of the things that was shocking to me as I began to ask the question, well, if they're using music or harm and acoustics and harmonic science to modify human consciousness, and there are certain frequencies that do that, uh, we don't have time here, I don't think, to go into it, but there are certain frequencies and certain tunings of uh, a space, of a sacred space, that will enhance meditative states and, and induce meditative states. I began to say, well, you know, what else were they doing in this space in, in order to modify their consciousness? And the minute you ask that question, then you immediately start looking at the communion drinks or, or breads that, that, that would be taken as part of these religious ceremonies and rites. And to this day, we still have communions in Christian churches, but of course, it's either grape juice or wine. And the, the, if you go back far enough, and you don't have to go that far in the Middle Ages, you began to start seeing that, oh, well, they were actually using some sort of entheogenic or psychoactive uh, substance to induce visions, and that this is what was going on in the temples. And you find uh, Roman Mithraeans, you know, for followers of Mithras. Uh, they even had stone tubs along the edge filled with salt water, and they would take the, the offering for Mithras, and it would it would be a, a psychoactive drink, and they would literally get in the salt water and float and uh, have you know a psychedelic experience, see into heaven and so forth. And you trace it further back, you find it through Babylon and Egypt, and and you find it in all of the ancient religions. And you go back into um, you look at the Rig, Rig, the Rig Veda, and you find that Soma which was the elixir of the gods, was a central element to Vedic cosmology and Vedic religion. And so the idea was they would take the communion of the teacher plant or the plant god, and it would allow their consciousness to leave its body and visit the, the gods in the sky. And that is the fundamental pattern of you know, religious rites and belief systems that have been repeated in many different ways over the millennia. At the bottom of it is this use of plants or fungi to provide a bridge between or to relink human consciousness with the sun or more specifically the energy uh, that the sun represents, which would be God. So resonance was kind of an inside and outside thing. You take the communion to sort of resonate, wake up your the energy in your body. The kundalini serpent would rise up through the body, uh, through the chakras, and into the brain, and out the crown of the head, or the ushnisha, as the Buddhists would call it, protuberance. And this inner resonance would then be further controlled or enhanced by the use of outer resonance, which would be chant and perhaps music within a resonant chamber, which are these temples and chapels and so forth. Rosalind was the key for me to begin looking in the right directions. It does all of these things and more. It's like a compendium of all the religious rites and symbolisms of all times just put into this one carved into this one stone chapel. And so it's a very good reference for us to link our modern way of thinking through a 15th century, you know, medieval chapel, Christian chapel, which was really a front for uh, a very ancient temple rites that go back to pre-Christian times. You know, I think it's both funny and tragic at the same time that here we have pretty good evidence that entheogens, psychedelics, that whole experience is possibly at the root of not only the evolution of human consciousness, but also the development of Western civilization, as we've come to understand it and know it today. And we've since completely turned our back on that idea. And now we outlaw these technologies as class one narcotics, and no one can gain access to these, I guess, tools, you would say, of self-discovery, self-awareness. That's all they are. They're technologies. They're tools that can help us 
enter a different state of mind, enter a different type of consciousness. And we all know that consciousness precedes all physical action. Thought leads to action. If you're thought, if you're grounded in a certain way of thinking, and you've never done any self-analysis, and you're just kind of focused on the external, well, then you're going to create what we see all around us, and it's disastrous. But the people that are self-aware and have done some self-analysis, sometimes with these technologies, sometimes without them, you know, I think you get into a better space, and I think society would benefit, if nothing else, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there there's dangers inherent in taking psychoactive substances. So some people can't deal with it, and others can. And that was, of course, that was never a problem prior to, you know, the past 50 years, I guess. I mean, I mean there was a certain amount of risk that was assumed in just, you know, being alive. I guess in the past, well, let's say, 1,500 years, the suppression of the use of psychoactive compounds in religious settings was very largely the result of, of the Roman Church outlawing uh, psychoactive communions in uh, around the 5th century, pretty much right after the, the fall of the Roman Empire. Early Christianity was competing with other mystery schools, the, you know, the, the worship of Sybil and Attis, as well as uh, Mithras, both of those were very popular, and much more popular than Christianity in Rome, for instance, at that time. And by outlawing the use of those psychoactive communions, they were eliminating that, the, the core of those religions, and they died out pretty quickly. That, uh, combined with some force, you know, it was very effective. <laughs> and, and so it was, over time, the Roman Church, you know, continued to, you know, they just saw no value at all in letting individuals have any kind of direct revelatory experience. And it didn't really start, you know, we could blame it all on the Roman Church, and certainly they deserve a lot of that, but it didn't just start with them. I mean, the Hebrew priests were outlawing the use of psychoactive compounds, you know, somewhere around, I think they, from what I've been able to find, somewhere around between three and 400 BC, they began restricting the use of those kind of compounds or, or plants and so forth for the priests and then ultimately for just the high priest. And only once a year during Yom Kippur, you know, would those be used. Uh, so there's been a tendency for the priestly class to want to keep uh, all of that, that's magic stuff, secret, and the, for the laity to just depend upon the priest to tell them what they see. And that developed ultimately into uh, the holy books, like the Quran or the Torah or the Bible, being that revelation, you know, all of those visions that these different people had and they compiled together and that had been selected and edited out over time as being sufficient and that people no longer need to have those kind of direct revelatory experiences if they just believe, you know, in this particular faith. Same thing, though, for Hinduism and Buddhism. I mean, yes, there's still some Vedic priests that are doing doing some you know, some sort of psychoactives at, from t at times, uh, certain certain times of the year, certain rituals. And, you know, there's even uh, some Zoro Zoroastrians that are doing it as well. But it's not, even within those communities, it's not well understood or acknowledged. It's pretty much kept secret. And, yeah, like you said, this goes pretty far back. Instance that comes to mind is the Elysian Mysteries, where they would have that festival every year. It was basically, I think, invitation only. Well, a lot of people were able to go, but only a few people were able to go, you know, into the cave to see the special whatever was in there and whatever rites were being done in there. So yeah, they used a substance, or they used something called kaikion in the Elysian Mysteries. And there's the Dionysian Mysteries, which was the Bacchanalia. I mean. These people were drinking, you know, they, wine was a base, but they they would add things to the wine. They would create special elixirs uh, for different occasions and different initiations. But this kind of thing was going on even through the Middle Ages. The Cathars had something called the Consolamentum, 
that they would give to initiates and also the people when they were dying. And they believed they, that to not have the consolamentum drink when you're dying was a blasphemy, that, that they felt that it helped put people into a state that would more, help them more easily transition into the afterlife. Uh, so that was very common, and up until the Crusades were launched against them. The Albigensian Crusade was the beginning of, you know, eradicating the Cathars and, in Southern Europe and this use of consolamentum, you know, the psychoactive revelatory drink or substance. So the fact that we're at a place today, like you said, where such substances are banned, you know, both uh, religiously, scientifically, socially, in every way possible. It's it's the worst thing in the world that you can do. Was exactly the the thing that the entire history of humanity relied on, <laughs> and was instrumental in raising interest and curiosity in things like you know, the geometry of nature and how would we express that with numbers and so forth. How would we understand the patterns of the sky? All of those things were inspired by this desire to relink and take have a personal revelatory experience where you can, you know, see into other realms. So this kind of brings me to my my new book that I'm working on, which is tentatively named the Vajra sequence it proposes this book proposes it's a it's a fiction but it's fiction based on lots and lots of accumulated historical facts scientific facts and and uh, so i you know like any good science fiction i blend as much reality and really just use the fiction the story as a thread to to present a concept and this concept is that science will develop into, at some point, and I'm not sure how long it will take, but I feel it's inevitable that it will develop back into what science used to be, which was the, uh, rather than the ex exploration of the outer realm and the outer world, uh, an exploration of the inner, and that is uh, what you might call psychonautics instead of astronautics. And so I propose the, uh, in this story, the through the development of various characters, this emergence of a science that combines the ancient arts of consciousness modification, which you know includes uh, psychoactive compounds, resonance, and so forth, you know, incubation or isolation that was practiced in, in ancient times, with modern tools, which would be uh, a combination of you know, sensory deprivation, there's a, the Gansfeld effect, for instance, is a way of inducing visions using near static fields in your auditory visual senses, and a variety of other things. And I just sort of build this story up around the reemergence of this new sort of spiritual science that explores uh, these other realms and actually increases lucidity and begins to uh, communicate in a lucid fashion with other dimensions. And that's that's what where the story is going. It's, it's all tied in also with global political and financial activities because, uh, you know, like any good story, it, it starts simple and, and grows into a, a bigger picture. And so I try to take it as broad a vision as I can as to what the impact of such a birth of a new scientific field would be. And at the bottom of it is harmonics, the physics of resonance. Yeah. So I guess the last question I'd like to ask you is, what do you think all this tells us about the nature of human consciousness? Well, there's a, a book made, uh, called The Physics of Consciousness that that is that kind of has helped me pull some of these ideas together. And there's other books that, that connect as well with my own studies. And the way I see consciousness is probably like Tesla saw consciousness, and a lot of people are beginning to see consciousness. And that is that it's a process of resonance into the body, that the body uh, acts as a kind of antenna or transceiver. The self 
the an identity that is sort of you know beneath it all connects them with a particular body uh, with a particular DNA configuration that creates a, a receiver or a transmitter, and that uh, consciousness is non-local. It's just merely bundled up or focused through uh, a body. And that's, you know, this is speculation, but it's speculation based on uh, both science as, as well as um, reports and experiences of many people. Uh, they either go through very severe and, and advanced uh, meditative process, or they take some sort of a psychoactive compound to an extent that they they have visions beyond normal senses. And somewhere in science, these things need to fit. They need to have a home. They need to have an understanding and a framework that, that makes sense. And I think that what is being proposed these days, that a thought is essentially, or let's, let's say a, a, an individual synapse spark, a spark across a synapse gap in a neuron, is a buildup of electrons uh, or electron charge, and that these electrons are uh, they're non-local. I mean, they're they're popping into into and out of existence. You know, some are more stable than others, but the buildup of charge is largely a function of non-local charges building and or not. And so, if a spark across a synapse occurs. There is a very rapid but still variable process that's going on that is that involves and intersects non-local activity that we can't we can't identify. It's not local, and so the, the question becomes: you know, are there quantum effects or non-local effects at work in the brain uh, affecting uh, thought and action? You know, maybe. Maybe much of what we do is autonomous. It's based on the body responding to its environment. But this concept of free will or consciousness or identity that introduces more to, you know, that's the ghost in the machine, if you will, seems to, seems to be supported by the fact that there's quantum effects going on. And that as science continues to develop, we're able to find this, find these quantum effects more and more, this entanglement and so forth, more and more at the macro level of ordinary reality. And I think that in time, that they'll realize that this idea of artificial intelligence only gets you so far. You can create a response-based system that controls a robot, for instance, or just a computer, that, and it interacts with the environment and can seem quite human. But this idea of non-local consciousness resonating into that is probably not going to happen until they realize that you need something like DNA. You need something like, you know, the transceiver effect that would occur in an organic life form. And when they finally get to that point, I think that's when this, the spiritual realms, if you will, are, are the recognition of non-physical realities will begin to merge with physical science. And you know, it, in many ways, it, it sounds like a, a dualistic conception of reality, but I, dualism, there's something to it, but it's obviously very wrong in another way, in that I don't think there is distinctly different substances interacting. There's only one universe. There's only, you know, we're all the same stuff, only in different arrangements. So the idea of dualism, or calling it dualism, I think is, again, we talked about language earlier. I don't think that's the right way of putting it. But I like the idea of, like, interactionism. You know, we have one manifestation of this universal process in the brain interacting with the process that is not as material or is not as corpuscular. It's more fluid. So we have these intersecting orders or these intersecting processes that are going on. And this is how... Eco ecologies work, that's how the quantum world works, it's undeniable. And so to say, okay, the mind is the one thing that doesn't have, is the only closed system in the universe, it's madness. Same thing with DNA. I mean, yes, DNA has limitations to what can be changed, but it's not a closed system. It's a myth. And so I think these are largely myths that are propagated, again, to defend these belief systems that, again, there can't be anything right about what 
mystics have said in the past. We have to fight that tooth and nail, even if we have to devolve into kind of irrational arguments to defend it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, yes. I, yeah, I mean, like, I think dualism and interactionism, I think there's a lot of science out there that the old objections to that idea like, no longer hold. And, you know, we don't have enough time to talk about all that evidence. It would require a whole other episode, but I encourage people to go look into the work of people like Carl Pregram, Bruce Crazy, near-death experience stuff, you know, the psychedelics, anything you want. There's all kinds of gateways to find out really what's going on with the mind. So, yes, there's a physical, mechanical aspect of the mind, like you mentioned. We can reproduce that in AI, but I don't think we can re reproduce the human either. I think there's something very novel going on that we're only yeah. beginning to scratch the surface of. Yeah, and I would say, I guess, is a, la a last commentary, and as part of what you're doing is directing people to do their own research, is that if you look into uh, the work of, for instance, Dr. Rick Straussman and his studies on DMT, the spirit molecule, there's a book. By that name, but there's also other research uh, along those lines as well as to what kind of effects some of these uh, psychoactive compounds have on the brain and the kind of experiences that people have. It's easy to understand. I mean, when you, for instance, uh, you, you take you people take a, a significant dose of DMT, they will, in their own experience, leave their body altogether and find themselves in other places, often communicating with beings of some sort. And and this, you know, this is this, there's studies that where they dosed people like that and recorded what they experienced, and there's certain commonalities between these experiences and, for instance, near death experiences or other sorts of uh, strange or what you'd call paranormal normal experiences. And you real and, and then you realize that this was very common was done to meet the gods in ancient times, and that that human civilization, that humanity has developed out of this relationship with the plant world as a as a teacher to consciousness uh, and to sort of being aware of the surroundings, you know becoming more objective and curious and all of the things that we think of as human traits, but much of this was inspired by these mind-blowing experiences that people have had for millennia. And that we may, again, one day return to some of those explorations only in a more, perhaps a safer and more controlled fashion, fashion than, than what was done, has been done in the past. And that that there is some hope that doing so, it will start tearing down some of the the old walls that were built, you know, between the Roman Church and the and the natural philosophers, and that and that there will be more credence given to to the understandings that the ancients had and that wrote in some of those ancient writings. You know, I mean, I. I think every pantheon had its teacher plant or its mushroom or whatever, and that depending on what you what you took and the group you were with, you developed your group of gods. But at the at the end, they're all the same, and it's all an aspect of a reality greater than the physical that we currently tune into. It's highly speculative, no doubt, but there's a whole lot of real experience out there that's pointing in this direction, and I think it needs to be taken seriously. And truth be told, there's very little in this world that is not speculative when you really dig below the surface. Everything that's is, true too. That's you know, true. It, it's all interpretation. There's, yes, there's facts, but there's always questions about the dynamics surrounding those facts and the meaning of those facts. And so I think we need a more open-minded, democratic approach to study these kind of topics and, and less dogma, less absolutism, and really less, well, more more humble approach from people. I don't think anyone should have to come into conflict. I don't, you know, I, I'm never telling anyone, oh, you better believe this. I'm saying, go look at it yourself, and you decide. If you come to a different conclusion, that's okay. But don't tell me I'm a fool, or, you know, don't yeah. insult me. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, there's just as much dogma in the science world as there is in the religious world, and you have to break through all of that in order to try to begin to open yourself up to 
what might actually be going on here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, nowadays, that's kind of what may, makes life so attractive. It really is a mystery, even though we're taught that it's not. And I think that's something we have to start rediscovering. And then that'll open up all kinds of new paths for people to, to be creative again. Because when you think that everything's decided, you have no impetus to be creative. Yep. So we have to start engaging people on that level. So, you know, you already talked about your book, but before we get going, you want to just leave us with any parting thoughts or anything like that? Well, I would say if you, I have a couple of pages on Facebook that has a lot of archived information and graphics and things like that that people might be interested in. Uh, one is, uh, you know, facebook.com slash interference theory is one page, and the other one is facebook.com slash the Venus Blueprint. And then there's my, my website, which has a, a whole lot of, of information on it as well that isn't, can be found in the Facebook area or in the books. And that's at interferencetheory.com. And, you know, I would say that, you know, I've, I'm, I've actually got two books that are in the works. The, the Vajra sequence is one. That's the, the fiction novel, which will be a, a mind blower, I think, for a lot of people, even if they know this material or are familiar with it. It's, it's put together in such a way that's a lot of fun for presenting some of these ideas in a, in a modern context or a futuristic context. And then the other one is called Harmonic Evolution. And, there's a paper out there on the website that you can find in that uh, area that that summarizes it, and that's been that was published in the Proceedings of the Natural Philosophy Alliance. And that uh, anyway, there's other information there that proposes and describes my thoughts on how evolution could be extended uh, to include uh, atomic resonance as a um, ordering. You know, as a, as a guide, basically, to evolution at a more fundamental level. Anyway, there's other stuff uh, uh, and artwork and things that I have done out there that were kind of fun. So um, I would encourage anybody that wanted to learn more to go to interferencetheory.com. Yep, and I will provide links for people to, to jump to those quickly and without hassle. And I'd like to thank you again for making time for me today. It's been an interesting conversation as always. Thanks again. Well, thank you, John. We'll be talking.